Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here again for the next uh, Next Gen Precision Health Discovery Series. This is our flagship seminar, really a seminar that's designed to reach out in the public across the state, and my vision is eventually across the country. Uh, and we talk about topics that are relevant to the community, to the public, and the things that we're excited about from a research perspective as well. Um, and uh, it's my huge honor to uh, introduce Dr. Kelsey Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin is the Executive Vice President of the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative. So that's a really big deal to have here, her here talking to us today. So as everybody probably knows, uh, the fourth floor of Next Gen Precision Health, the Roy Blunt Building, is uh, planned to be open next year, and it's gonna have a large focus on neuroscience. We're heavily recruiting neuroscientists uh, focused on neurodevelopment uh, diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and also neurotrauma. And so uh, uh, Dr. Martin is gonna talk to us about lessons from the Simons Foundation program in autism research. She was previously the dean of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA between 2015 and 2021. She is currently a professor in biological chemistry and psychiatry. Her lab is interested in how our experiences alter our gene expression and affect interconnectivity between neurons. And so please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Martin. All right, well, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. What a beautiful building and, and beautiful campus. Um, and I'm delighted to um, tell you about the Simons Foundation. My disclosures, no disclosures to make. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here in a precision uh, health series um, uh, because I think it's sort of the definition of how do you put together uh, biomedical research, clinical medicine, community engagement to really address the needs um, uh, of, of the public and of um, our nation in improving health. Uh, so for Missouri, for society, for the world, it really is a pleasure to be here. And I thought what I would do is give you a little bit of a background, even though it is next generation, about where I come from and sort of, because I think that our own biographies do influence the work that we do. Um, so I actually was an English and art major in college, and I um, then went after college to do, become a Peace Corps volunteer in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, um, and I did public health work. I wanted to do something that I thought would have an impact, and it was in child and maternal health. And when I was there, 20% uh, of children died before the age of five from uh, infectious diseases. And, uh, and that was really due to a number of issues, poor nutrition, kids became very dehydrated and really had low reserves. Um, so as a Peace Corps volunteer, set up a big um, educational program to train midwives and childcare workers about you know, nutrition, sanitation, so lots of public education, but also set up a, a vaccination program for the large rural zone of about 30,000 individuals. And that vaccination program had an incredible impact. So every year at the same time, there was always a measles epidemic that led to significant morbidity and mortality uh, in children. And what, you know, the year following a very massive vaccination program that was really a combination of, of education, community engagement, community organization, you can imagine no electricity in that rural zone, so trying to set up a cold chain uh, completely transformed um, the outcome. There was just no, no measles epidemic. And so that inspired me to go to medical school. I had to go back and take pre-med courses, um, and I worked in a lab while I was doing that and, and sort of fell in love with, uh, with research. I was working on HIV, and so I ended up going um, to, uh, do an MD PhD, I worked on viruses. And while I was doing my uh, psychiatry clerkship, I was so struck by the fact that every other specialty, we really learned as student, medical students, all the therapies were very much based on an understanding of the physiology of that organ system. And that just was not the case in psychiatry. And the, and the, um, the, the conditions that were being treated were so important in terms of public health issues, in terms of the behavioral health of 
of, um, of the population that I decided I wanted to go and really learn more about brain sciences. So I went to work uh, with Eric Kandel to try to understand how does experience really change connectivity in the brain. And I've pursued that for uh, decades now um, since then. And my research is very basic. It's basic molecular neurobiology and cell biology. I want to understand how experience um, changes gene expression in nerve cells in the brain to change the way that they connect with one another. And that's really the hypothesis be, uh, behind how memories are formed. Um, one could say behind how therapy, which is forming a different f type of memory, um, uh, is effective. And so, you know, it's really interesting as a cell biologist because if you think about nerve cells, they're such beautiful, complex cells with incredible morphology that extend these large processes, make hundreds of connections with one another called synapses. And so my lab for years has studied how does experience change the genes that are turned on in the nucleus, but also something called post-transcriptional gene expression. How do you change um, how proteins are made at specific compartments of that neuron, and that allows for a lot greater uh, um, information storage in the brain. I love this kind of work. I love looking at microscopes. I love doing electrophysiology. I, there's something for me very satisfying, but I also have always been driven to understand how do you go from something so basic as this to having a, an impact on somebody's life, and how do you take the information that comes from clinical medicine that I think is more and richer and richer because of all the data that's available now, for example, through electronic medical records, and have that help guide the kind of research that's being done at the bench. And so I ended up, and, and I had a number of roles where I ran the MD-PhD program because that was so important to me. And then honestly, also because when I went to UCLA, only 20% of the MDPG students were women. And I was told that that was because they, had, they became pregnant and they left. And I had had my first child while I was an MDPG student. So I felt like, well, I'm going to show them. And I ran the program and really increased the percentage of women students in the program. And then I was chair of my department. And I was always advocating as chair for making sure that we had a lot of interactions between the basic science departments and the clinical departments. And when the, um, the former dean left to go to become the, exec the vice chancellor for health at Duke, I was asked to become the interim dean. And I thought, well, I'm the one who's been advocating for this, so I might as well step up to the plate and, and um, do what I can do to make sure that we do achieve that synergy. And I thought UCLA was a great place to do it because it's a single campus that has a health system and the rest of the campus on the same footprint. Um, and so I did that for six years. I ended up going through the search and becoming the dean of the, of the medical school. And again, was very satisfied building our Institute for Precision Health, trying to put different neurosciences together. Um, you may all know that you know, there's neuroscience in neurology, in psychiatry, um, in neurosurgery, in neuropathology, and really trying to make sure that we have a united um, sort of community around neuroscience. And then um, two years ago, uh, or three years ago, I was asked if I would look at a role at the Simons Foundation. Um, and so I made this big move across the country, back to New York for me, and I was inspired to do that because um, of the, the mission of the foundation. So it was established, the foundation was established in 1994 by Jim and Marilyn Simons. Uh, it's in New York City, and its mission is really to advance research in basic science and mathematics. So interestingly, instead of coming at it from a clinical side and trying to bring the you know, make sure we're supporting the basic science, I thought, oh, this is an interesting way to say, how do we take that basic science side and really put that sort of in the begin at the center, but make sure that it's informed by and translated into, into discoveries that are going to make a difference. Um, the foundation is, um, I think of it as it, it is really includes two different major groups. It has a grant-making side, and that's where 
um, Safari, the Simons Foundation Autism Research in, uh, Initiative that I'll tell you about in more detail, and Neuroscience Live, and that's the group that I oversee. There's a Life Sciences Group, a Math and Physical Sciences Group, and a real commitment to public education that's called the Science Society and Culture, and really making sure that uh, that knowledge about basic science and the, and the wonder that, that basic science um, can inspire uh, is, is supported. There's also an intramural program that's part of the Simons Foundation, and it's all dry lab computational uh, science. So there's a Center for Computational Astrophysics, Computational Biology, Lots of the work in, on, on genes involved in autism is done by individuals at the Center for Computational Biology, Computational Math, uh, Computational Quantum Physics, and the newest, which is Computational Neuroscience. And what this means, really, is that we have incredible expertise and um, richness in, in, um, in computation, both hardware but also people's brains who are part of that whole community. Um, Safari itself, so the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative was founded in two, launched in 2003, uh, and it has a mission of improving the understanding, the diagnosis, and the treatment of autism spectrum by funding innovative research of the highest quality and relevance. Uh, its budget in 2023 was about $100 million. Um, it's, uh, Again, within Safari, there are sort of three major buckets of activity, and they grew organically out of the history of Safari. So the first is convening. Uh, 2003, the foundation convened a, a roundtable of scientists really to ask them, what's the state of research in autism research, and what would be promising approaches to have an impact? Um, we continue to convene. We have lots of annual, we have our annual meeting for the Safari investigators. We have a lot of workshops um, and, and different smaller meetings, all intended at bringing people together with a real interest on sharing knowledge, interest in interdisciplinary approaches. And when I say interdisciplinary, I mean different disciplines, but also going from more basic to more clinical to make sure that people are in the same room talking about problems. And, and also for us to identify emerging areas for investment. Uh, then we have a large uh, grant-making portfolio in that first RFA, a request for application, was made in 2006 when, when Jerry Fishback, who was the founding director of Safari, came on. Uh, and so every year we um, release a number of requests for applications, uh, review those grants. We use a lot of... Um, of scientists to help with the peer review of those grants, and then we provide funding to those, but with the real importance that we want to make sure that um, in the convening, we bring those scientists together to share their information, and that because of our interest in informatics and in data, that we then create um, databases where that data becomes available to the full research community. And that's part of this other component, which is building resources. So as we support research, we want to make sure that we're building resources that are going to advance knowledge in um, autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. And the first resource that was built is called the Simon Simplex Collection. And, um, and I'll get to that in a minute to learn a little bit more about that. But I do want to just say you know, that original thinking about this, how, what the... Where, the, where should we start? Where should, the Simon, where should Safari start? Again, think back to like 2003, 2006. Um, one, autism is an incredibly common condition. So it is something really important to be looking at. It is um, the latest uh, um, numbers for prevalence from the um, CDC uh, from 2020 state that it's one in 36. That number is increasing um, every year. So if you look, again, if you go back to when the, when the foundation really started, it was more like 1 to 125 or 1 to 110. Now up to 1 uh, in 36 eight-year-olds are, are meeting criteria for, for autism. And um, 
you know, what are the reasons for this? I think they're incredibly complex. I'm not going to go into them. Certainly some of them have to do with diagnostic criteria, increased diagnosis. Um, there is a, um, uh, you know, when you, what is autism, it's really defined, its core symptoms are challenges with social interaction in the presence of stereotypic and repetitive behaviors, but there are many, many different uh, manifestations. And so um, that is a kind of like other psychiatric conditions, it is really truly a spectrum and it's defined uh, behaviorally. In fact, if you look at the um, Diagnostic Statistical Manual DSM-5, uh, and this is from 2013, the current uh, diagnostic criteria include persistent deficits in social communication and social interactions, it includes repetitive um, uh, restricted behavior, uh, patterns of behavior or interests. Um, these symptoms have to be present in the early developmental period. They have to cause clinically significant impairment and they're not better explained by intellectual uh, disability. Uh, these are pretty broad criteria and I think that, that to me that's one of the really important features of trying to set out a program to understand, um, to better understand autism is that incredible heterogeneity. The clue that I think really was the, the, the um, spark, um, no pun intended as you'll learn going forward, um, to, to the approach is that autism around the time of the launch of Safari was known to be one of the most heritable neuropsychiatric disorders. So that means that if an identical twin has autism, there's a, somewhere between a 70 and 90% likelihood that the other identical twin will meet criteria for autism. Fraternal twins, it, it drops down to about 30% and siblings to about 20%. So that's important epidemiological information that indicates that there is a large genetic component, but it also clearly indicates that there are environmental components. So I think you know, one message I would want to get across is by really a focus on the genetics doesn't mean that genetics cause autism. It means that these, that this is, that that's the sole um, contributor. But what it means is that it's part of it. And this was a tractable approach at that time because of the incredible revolution in genetic and genomic technologies that was coming online with sequencing uh, technologies. And so that led to this first large resource called the Simon Simplex Collection. And it was a, a project that was designed to bring in individuals with uh, autistic children, their parents, and an unaffected um, sibling. And the idea was that this would allow for identification of new or de novo genetic variants that if identified in the autistic individual, were likely to contribute to their autism. Um, it was a really beautifully des designed program that had about 12 clinical sites. And um, Catherine Lord, who helped develop the uh, autism diagnostic observational schedule, made sure that every clinical site across the country was employing the same diagnostic criteria so that there was really standardization from one site to the other. And then um, samples were uh, um, taken from all of the participants. The total was about 26, 2,700 individuals. And that really opened the way to the identification of a, no a number of new de novo genetic mutations that contribute to autism. It was such a success that, the, that Safari has continued to invest in cohorts of, individ, of autistic individuals and their families to identify um, genes. So that includes this original um, cohort, which was this quad design of an autistic child, unaffected sibling, two unaffected parents. Um, another cohort that is a, an inpatient cohort, the autism inpatient collection, um, is um, uh, led by uh, Matt Siegel uh, and is a, it includes um, 
I think there are six sites inpatient wards for ch autistic children, so these are more severely affected individuals. And because they're inpatient, there is richer clinical information along with the sequencing information. And then the two large cohorts that we're currently funding, um, one that many people here may know about is SPARC because uh, uh, Missouri and the Thompson Center are really important um, sites for recruitment uh, for SPARC. Uh, and SPARC is uh, the world's largest uh, study of autism. We now have um, about 340,000 participants, about 110,000 autistic individuals, and the rest are family members. That's a phenotype first cohort. So individuals who have a professional diagnosis of autism can elect to join uh, SPARC, um, and they can also um, consent to give us a, a spit or a saliva sample um, so that they can get uh, uh, exome sequencing so they can get sequencing of their genetic information and they can opt in if they want to get results back if there is a finding to have those results given back to them by a genetic counselor. But there are lots of other components of SPARC that I'll go into detail that I think make it really a great example of how a cohort like this is a way of bringing together the community members and scientists to solve the problem collectively, to get to increase knowledge collectively. Another really active cohort for um, Simons is the Simon Searchlight Collection. And Simon Searchlight Collection um, is a little bit different because it's a genes first. So individuals who have a genetic finding join Simon Searchlight. And there are over 170 different um, uh, family groups, so groups of of, that have children who have a known mutation in a known gene. And again, here, what we're doing is both providing that community support through education, through information, collecting information, making sure that that's made available to the research community. And I'm going to go into that in some more detail. But there's an important principle that I do want to raise here in the context of sort of precision health and genomic medicine, which is, you know, here we have a, a phenotype first. This is a, a professional behaviorally defined diagnosis. About maybe 10, a little less than 10 percent of the, of the participants in SPARC end up with the genetic finding using the techniques that we currently use for identifying genetic variants. Um, and here, this is a, a group where they have a genetic finding, but even within those groups, there's significant variability in, their, in the symptoms that they display. And so it really starts to tell you a little bit, tells me certainly, about the complexity of, of what contributes to a particular um, condition. So, so all of this investment in cohorts, in genomics and genetic sequencing. At the current state, we have lists of hundreds of genes that explain really a small percentage of autism. So we have something that we call the SPARC gene list. This is now from last year, from 2022. It has a number of what are called copy number variants. It has a number of chromosomal differences where pieces of the chromosome move around. And then it has a number of mutations or, in, in, or variants in specific single genes. Um, these are all contribute a small um, uh, you know, the, these, as I told you, only about 10% of participants even have a finding here. And what we know is when you have a single gene like this, one of these what are called de novo damaging variants, it can really dramatically increase your risk for having autism, but they're not very frequent in the population. And to think about it, you know, one way of looking at this is thinking about what is that genetic architecture of autism uh, look like. It's likely that there are a number of common variants that are present. So you can see all of these um, different genetic contributors um, that really by themselves have low um, sort of risk for contributing to autism. But as a collection, 
depending on how they come together, they might produce autism. And then there are these rare variants that because of the way that science works, they're the easy ones to identify, but they're not present in, in very many individuals. And so I think we get to a state where we go, well, what, you know, if we say that we know that a variant in specific, you know, in gene X um, increases the likelihood of having autism, it still doesn't really explain autism. The way that I think about it is that it creates a tool that we can use to now dig in deeper to try to understand something about the biology of autism. And so these genes, whether it's from the Simon Simplex collection or from Spark, they're rare, but they really can be used um, as tools to elucidate something about the biological processes that contribute to autism. And you know, again, I'm a cell bio molecular cell biologist, and I think one thing that one learns is that things are always much more complex, especially in the brain, because there are so many redundant pathways, and the brain has to interact with the environment and change how it responds. So I'm going to tell you two sort of um, a couple stories about that. But really, again, if you want to understand causality, in 20 you know, 2006, the big bet was made, let's look at the gene. And I imagine there probably was some hope that it would be simple <laughs> and that it would explain a lot of that heterogeneity. And I think what we've learned is that there's huge heterogeneity in the genetic architecture. And we already know, as human beings, as you know, parents and community members and scientists, that there's enormous heterogeneity um, at the uh, cognition and behavior level. There's a big hope right now in science that we can find some convergence here. People look at the genes, for example, and they say, well, a lot of those genes that are rare de novo mutants, a lot of them are located at two particular cellular compartments. They're lo and this is a complicated slide, but I just use it as an example. If you think about the brain, it, it's made up of a lot of different cell types, but if you look at neurons, you know, neurons, as I said, have this beautiful architecture where they have a nucleus, where the DNA is. Um, and then they send out these long, elaborate processes, and they connect with other nerve cells at sites that are called synapses. Well, it turns out that a lot of the de novo variants that are, have been identified encode um, uh, genes, uh, have genes that encode proteins that are in the nucleus that modify DNA either through the chromatin or their transcriptional regulators. And then a lot of them encode proteins that are at the synapse, at that site of communication between, uh, between neurons. And so, you know, that's then led to a lot of biology saying, you know, what's the role of chromatin uh, modifications in brain development? What's the role of synapses? Can we focus on synaptic function, on the balance between excitation and inhibition? So you can use those genes to come up with those frameworks to try to dig in a little bit more to get at some of the bi underlying biology. Um, I'm going to argue, and I think that the uh, direction for the field and for the Simons Foundation in addition is really to say, well, now can we also use some great science to start to understand a little bit better this heterogeneity. And I can tell you again, as more of a molecular person, if somebody said, well, there's a, you know, there, look at this gene and model it, and then they said, well, you know, and I want to model it, let's say, in a mouse or in a cell culture system, and they said, well, model autism. How do you model autism <laughs> in a cell culture system or, or in, a, in a mouse? And so can we start to break that phenotype and that behavior down into more discrete categories that we can then do a better linkage between that heterogeneity at the genetic level and the heterogeneity? We know what we're modeling there. And so um, that is one of the approaches. And again, just to underscore that heterogeneity, I love this piece that came out. One of the things that Simon does as part of that outreach education is it publishes um, an editorially independent journal called Spectrum that's really the news source for autism. And last year, they had this feature of Allison Singer, who's the president of Autism Spectrum Foundation, uh, Autism Science Foundation. Uh, called It's Time to Embrace Profound Autism. And what she wrote is, autism can meet genius or an IQ below 30. 
Autism can mean highly verbal or nonverbal. It can mean graduating from Harvard Law School or exiting high school with a certificate of attendance. If we're going to be able to personalize our approach to care, as the Lancet Commission, which came out uh, about a year and a half ago, report suggests, we need terminology and language that are specific and meaningful rather than terminology that lumps everyone together. And this has created a political problem in the field because there's a large neurodiversity movement. There's also people who are profoundly autistic and really trying to address how if we're, you know, I can tell you standing here, if I'm leading an effort to try to advance the understanding of autism, it's a really big field. And so how do we say what, you know, how, how do we stop lumping together, not just for care, for care certainly, but also for increasing, under, for deeper understanding. And so um, two of the um, requests for applications that we put out, uh, one, we're in the third year, is we call human cognitive and behavioral um, science. And it's really the scope is to do studies in humans to produce foundational knowledge about the neurobehavioral heterogeneity of ASD by quantitating cognitive and behavioral phenotypes. So we support a number of investigators um, and teams of investigators to do this. And I do think this is going to be really critical going forward. And I'm going to underscore doing it in humans um, because uh, we really, uh, again, I'm a molecular person. I believe deeply in, you know, uh, conservation across evolution, but there are uniquely human things, and there's certainly a history uh, that shows that we need to test uh, interventions in humans. So the other is a, a new RFA that we're just, uh, we've, it's just closed recently, is the cross-species studies of autism. And here what we've done is we've asked for applications that are coordinated studies across species one of which is human and one of which is non-human. So studies of ASD relevant behaviors, and we're very open, but we sort of focused here on sensory function, on motor function, and sleep. That, those are three that we think are important, but we want to hear from others. And then their underlying neurobiological mechanisms. So the approach here is to really say, we want to have that information be bi-directional. You know, clinical scientists, um, work, working together with preclinical scientists to make sure that what is being modeled in an animal system is relevant and also that the clinical scientists are benefiting from the sort of mechanistic uh, approaches from, that many preclinical scientists use and also some, some of the really advanced AI approaches that have been, are being used to characterize behavior in non-human animals now. Uh, as an example of that, this, this is a project that's a pilot project um, being done by Elon Dinstein, who's a scientist from Ben Gurion University, who's actually on sabbatical uh, at the Simons Foundation now. And that's a new, uh, we just, this is an experiment for us, I think a really successful experiment to have a scientist come and spend sabbatical time with us. And um, Elon is interested in sleep in autism, and so he's embarking on a pilot project uh, where he's using uh, an actigraphy uh, wearable device called Embrace that gives you all primary data. It's not the digested data you get from an Apple Watch or a, a, a Fitbit. Um, a dream headband for measuring uh, EEG. And then a mat that you put under the mattress and that measures the movement that you have in bed. And so those three, are being sent to, uh, um, will be sent to about 100 different Spark families, part of that large cohort, uh, targeting age 10 to 17 year olds. That's what that band fits best on. Uh, each participant will uh, be, they'll have recording for two to three weeks. An important principle for us is we're going to have this raw data. Um, released immediately to the research community. We have a database I'll show you that is all, you know, with all of the privacy protections in place. Um, and we view this as really a scalable and affordable approach for large scale 
uh, ASD phenotyping. There will be parent questionnaires and a sleep diary. So we're going to put this together and work with informaticists to try to make sure that we have the data in a, um, that we can make sense of all that data as it goes forward. Um, again, just as another example, that's not quite, it's not as, um, you know, focused on humans, but I just love as, as an example of how do you take a gene that was identified um, through our cohorts and use it to understand the biology in a way that I think holds the promise of really making a difference in people's lives. And that's a story from Lauren Orofice and, uh, and David Ginty at Harvard Medical School. And they've been interested, they're scientists who are interested in the peripheral nervous system. So of course we have a central nervous system in our brain and our spinal cord, but we have all sorts of peripheral uh, neurons throughout our body. They haven't been as much of a focus for the neuroscience field, but that's really what they've been focused on. This neurobiology of the sense of touch, and we have two different skin types, hairy and glabrous skin types, and that's, that's what they've studied. For, you know, that's really been the focus of their careers. So they became interested because um, overreactivity to light touch is, a com is pretty common among individuals with ASD. In fact, there's hyper and hyper uh, sensitivity to touch, but it is one of the most common features um, in autism. And so they thought, well, we should use this to see if something, if we can use some of our biology to understand more, um, put that together with the genes that have been identified and understand something more about um, autism. And so what they did is they generated mice that had uh, mutations in known autism genes. And so they knocked them out in all neurons in the, in the central and the peripheral brain. And so these are just two different variants of a, uh, in the red of a single autism gene and then two other autism genes. And they, me they developed a measurement of tactile sensitivity for those mice. And they saw that um, in these uh, genetically modified animals, there was an increased sensitivity to touch. So then what they did that was clever is they did it either in the central nerve cells in the brain or the, the nerve cells that are in the periphery. And they found that it's only when it's in the periphery that they saw this increased sensitivity. Why is this exciting? This is exciting because they then did a, uh, met with a um, uh, um, funding group, a biotech group, Deerfield, to say, can we start to develop some mo small molecules that target that periphery? And it's much easier to target the periphery than the central, than the brain. Um, and so they've been able to show in these mouse models that they have compounds that can address that tactile sensitivity. Um, and we are really interested in how can we partner with them to say, well, can we use something like Spark to be able to develop great measures of tactile sensitivity, quantitative measures of tactile sensitivity, that now we have a cohort that would be ready to address this problem, which actually is a really pretty, can be a very um, disabling uh, problem. So this is a story a little bit more about going from the biology back. All right, so I'm gonna um, end in the next, like, you know, seven minutes or so just to tell you about the cohorts because I want to bring up this other principle of how um, the knowledge that's gained from the cohorts can be shared with researchers, but that knowledge, we really need the participation of uh, providers and of the autism community. So Spark works because we have these partners, these clinical partners. This was this year's uh, clinical site uh, conference in New York. Uh, it is the, the PI of the program is Wendy Chung, who is a pediatrician and medical geneticist. And she recently moved from Columbia, which is very, Columbia is very convenient for the Simons Foundation. She just moved to um, be the uh, pediatrician in chief of uh, Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, and Children's Hospital. And so we are, she's continuing as the uh, principal investigator, and we're sort of re, just reorganizing it in a way that we'll be able to have even deeper ties with the clinical sites. And I think that's important because I think one clinical sites are, are sites of trust, and also it's easier to plug people into a system for care, uh, uh, if they, in particular if there is a genetic diagnosis. 
Um, our recruitment, again, we have these multiple sites. You'll see one site here that you know, the Thompson Center, um, uh, that is a really important site for us. And um, the clinical sites bring in about 66% um, of all of the participants. There's also an important social media component that we do a lot of outreach through social media to Spark. Um, and you can see it continues to increase over the years. Now we have over 335 uh, individuals, 135 individuals with autism. Um, who, who are they? This, was, this is old now. This is from the five-year progress report. But if you look at them, you know, we have, we have uh, the four, you know, about a one to four uh, girls to boys. Um, we, it is uh, demographically quite diverse, although we realized a couple years ago that we were underrepresented in the black African-American and the Asian-American populations, and so have made a major push uh, to incre increase the diversity of the cohort, both because we want that information um, about the, li the lived experience of families, but also it's really important from a genetics perspective to have that entire diversity of the of, um, of, uh, of genetic backgrounds. Um, a really, you know, a very large part of the Spark team, the Safari uh, Focus Spark team, is devoted to education, to hearing about what are the uh, what are the um, things that matter to families, and making sure that we can bring people in, including people from our clinical sites, to give webinars, uh, answer questions uh, for the participants. And, and that there really is value add. Uh, again, so one of the nice features is that Spark uh, individuals with genetic diagnoses can be um, invited to join Simon Searchlight, which is the genes first cohort. And, um, and we can also, we've developed something called Research Match, that if individuals want to conduct, a research, individual researchers want to conduct a research project, they can apply through Research Match, and we can then reach out to the Spark and Searchlight participants and ask them if they would like to participate in that study and be sort of the matchmakers, and in that way really enhance the knowledge that comes out of these cohorts. So I wanted to take um, just about two minutes to share. I think a lot of people know about Spark. I, I think fewer people know about Simon Searchlight, which is the genes first. And so we did make a little video that's really a public facing video that I wanted to share with you. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to do that. It can be lonely when you or someone you love is genetically one in a million. Endless nights searching for answers alone in the dark, waiting for things to click. Because what if the answers you need aren't somewhere else? What if the answer is you? What if your diagnosis is part of something much larger? Simon Searchlight can help connect you and your patient community to information. We are driven by science and united by hope. Simon Searchlight is an international research program founded by the Simons Foundation. We study more than 170 rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders, and we continually update and add to our list. We have a dedicated team of scientists, clinicians, geneticists, genetic counselors, communication and outreach specialists, digital product developers, research coordinators, and project managers who are all part of this study and work together to learn about your condition. They help learn about the issues and find answers to improve your care and your life. Researchers get access to the information you provide, such as survey data, blood samples, and cell lines. They also can access funding to make sure researchers are studying and looking at the complete picture of your condition. We work closely with an international community that includes patient organizations and scientists from around the world. Participants choose how much and when they want to provide information, online and at their convenience. But it's not a one-way street. We're creating a map where information flows from you and others to researchers and back to you again. And it's not just data you're connected to, it's also people. Through conferences, webinars, networking, and other community support. So even though your gene or genetic variant is rare, your unique insight is the key to unlock meaningful scientific advancements.
Simon Searchlight is here to help. We collect data from individuals with rare genetic disorders in their family. All right, so, so one of the things in there is we, people can give blood samples. And so we also do create, we take those blood samples, we have a bank of induced pluripotent stem cells, so where you can take uh, the blood from a donor and make a stem cell out of that, and from that generate neurons, and we make that available to researchers. Uh, and we do make a number of animal models. Uh, we support a brain bank because this is a human condition. I think we really need to understand um, the human brain, and so we do have a brain bank, a postmortem brain bank that we have for called Autism Brain Net, again, for advancing research through the gift of brain uh, uh, donation. And the goal here is to always make sure that these resources are able to support the you know, research of the highest quality and relevance. And again, we do enormous amount of work to make sure that the data that we, um, uh, f that's generated through the research that we fund is amplified, the impact is amplified uh, by, by having it available. So again, the induced pluripotent stem cell models, the autism brain net for the postmortem brain tissue. And um, through every effort, again, it has to be this marriage, this two-way street with the community, all of those cohorts have scientific advisory committees, but they also, SPARC has a community advisory committee, um, a, uh, um, diversity, equity, inclusion advisory committee, our research match program, all of the projects are evaluated by community members and by scientists. And at the Simons Foundation, we have something called the Participant Experience Team that allows participants in the, in the cohorts to be able to call if, with any question that they have. Um, and Safari Base, this is really the researcher facing component, is the place where you go if you have IRB approval and, and, and um, institutional sign off where you can get access to all of the data that's available um, uh, through the cohorts, through the, um, uh, the different tissue resources. So, to summarize, really, the guiding valuables, values and principles. Um, for, for SAFAR, which I do think of as a real precision health program, are that, you know, starting out the understanding the genomic architecture is going to provide a really rigorous way of um, dissecting out the, um, uh, the biology of autism, uh, and that quantitative phenotypic information is critical to parsing the heterogeneity and to elucidating its underlying biology. I think we're in sort of a magical state of science right now with wearables and nearables and sensors and uh, large data sets and AI and machine learning to be able to focus on that. We have an emphasis, the Simons Foundation is committed to basic science and math, so we do have an emphasis on basic understanding but a real commitment to translating work that will make a difference in people's lives. Uh, we're committed to open data. I hope I relayed that through our data sources. We're very interested in working with other funders. I brought up the Autism uh, Science Foundation, and um, part of that is how do we partner with other funders across the space to make sure that nobody's duplicating efforts, that we really are working in a synergistic manner. And we're committed to community participatory research with participants and community members and within the science community, the basic, the translation, the clinical, working together to really improve the lives of autistic individuals and their families. And I just want to end by thanking Jim and Marilyn Simons, who really, I think, had a unique, both generosity and vision. Um, the Simons Foundation, the Safari Science Team, all the Safari investigators, and, and all the Spark Searchlight teams and all of their participants. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So is the uh, tactile hypersensitivity uh, influencing the transition to sleep, uh, from wakefulness to sleep and back from sleep to work wakefulness, or uh, the time to wet a diaper uh, and how, how much you recover after your changing diaper? That's, yeah. that's kind of a silly question, but... I mean, they're 
great questions. And you know, honestly, I don't know the answers to them. But to me, that seems like a great hypothesis. I don't know if that's, you know, there, that may have been studied. I think that those are the kinds of, of um, questions that I think are rich. And it's, you know, it's tactile sensitivity. It's auditory sensitivity. So one could imagine that that, that might contribute to many different issues around sleep and around. Um, but again, you know, from my perspective, the more we can under, we can measure and understand the, sen the sensory sensitivity and measure and understand the sleep disturbances and measure and understand the GI disturbances, the clearer answer we'll get to questions like your answer, because we'll have a better way of really making sure that, there, that there's some causality there, I think. Yeah. Dr. Martin, it's a real honor to have you here at Mizzou. I'm a long fan of your research. In fact, your cell cover is my, I'm teaching neurobiology here at Mizzou. Yeah. It's, it's the most part, the highlights of my lecture. Oh, it's a, talking to the students, you can learn actually in a dish. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's an plasticity and being speci specific also be, you can you did it in a dish. That was amazing work. So you came from a, a pleasure background. I'm, I just noticed your model system does not include any invertebrate animals. Yeah. For example, I'm working with Drosophila, so we would like to hear maybe the Salmon Foundation is open to the idea of using fly genetics for discovery. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Um, that kind of warms my heart, <laughs> thank you. Um, Absolutely. I mean, we support uh, projects in flies and in worms. Um, I don't think there are any in Aplesia right now, but um, uh, in yeast. And it's just that we don't create those resources. And part of it is because, um, as you know, it's expensive to make mice. It's expensive to make rats. It's, it's less expensive to make worms and, and flies. And also, honestly, you know, coming from the aplesia culture, I can tell you one of the things that I so admire about the fly and the worm communities is they have been communities. They have shared resources and have shared you know, repositories. So that's why. It's not that we don't believe in that. And I would just add, that you know, as I was listening to the beginning of your question, I was thinking is that there is some irony that I yeah I I worked on on plasticity in a single dish you know and that's as reductionist as you can get I mean I really and I do I am a reductionist at heart and yet um, autism is about as complex as you can get as are most psychiatric disorders and I um, have become you know really concerned with what. Um, you know, how much we can learn from flies and mice and to, that's going to be applicable to human, especially to therapeutics. And, but I, I actually think there's a lot, and I think it depends on the level of analysis that one engages in. I'm, you know, I think that nucleo, you know, trafficking of molecules from the cytoplasm to the nucleus is not going to be that different in a depending on the organism, that there are some biological processes that are conserved and we can study them in the simplest possible system. But there are other processes that are much more complicated and that's one of the reasons why I think dissecting some of the um, behaviors into much simpler sort of syllables and components that can then be modeled in simpler systems, tractable systems, and then going back and forth is going to be important. Yeah, yeah. I think there's going to be a role for RNA binding proteins, which is what I did work, you know, do work on in the lab. So, we do have one question online. Yeah. Given the significant role that environmental factors play in the development of autism, is the Simons Foundation contemplating the collection of location data? pertaining to mothers during pregnancy and the program's location history. It goes without saying that strict privacy measures should be upheld. Yeah, well, we do have data about where the participants live. Um, uh, so that is there, and I think that that's going to be an important question. And, I, and you know, we certainly are interested in uh, and have supported studies looking at um, you know, maternal infection, for example. I think that there's a really, there, there is an opportunity for using the um, electronic health record to feed into um, Spark and Searchlight in a way that I think could carry some of that information as well. And, and I want to underscore, I agree with all the privacy issues. Um, 
I know that now we will release the geographic information for individuals, but only when there's a large enough cohort that individuals would not, to researchers, right? We would release it to researchers, but only if it's a large enough cohort that there's no possibility of identifying any individual. Yeah. Um, as we expand genetic research related to autism here, or the researchers at the university do, how does one submit uh, a gene that's likely linked to autism for addition to the list that you showed earlier? Yeah. And is there some minimum number of patients that uh, need to be confirmed by peers before it's added? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is, I mean, really it's by participating in Spark. So as we go through Spark and you know the number of, of uh, identified genetic variants, that those will get added to the to the Spark list, which is more complicated than just what's seen in Spark. It's also looking at some other databases um, to try to make sure that those those get added. And the, I, my background is laboratory medicine. I was inter wondering whether you have thought of creating so-called blood bank, which has got, we can isolate either leukocytes and store them, or metabolomics, so that we can study later. Or we can collect both blood samples as well as urine samples, so that it can become, if you identify a couple of parameters in urine, it can become as a biomarker for either for a diagnosis or for therapeutics. For example, if you do some if you do some interventions, whether we can be able to use that marker as a follow-up for the improvement of clinical cases. Yeah. So I, I think if I understood, you're really asking about can we look at metabolites, for example, in blood, but also in urine. So could we? So you know, something like that, I would say that to me is one of the requests for applications we have every year is for pilot projects. And that's the kind of project that I would go, you know, convince us that this is going to be informative. And, and I think, you know, I certainly am aware of a large field looking in the expososome, right, that you can look at urine, you can look at hair, you can look at, you know, and so we follow that. And I do think the science team at Safari is incredibly strong and reads the literature and goes to meetings and talks with investigators. And so I think those sorts of emerging ideas are always there and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's ripe for really in, in making an investment, but certainly we're interested in pilots to look at those kinds of questions, yeah. Looks like we have an, one more online. Can you talk about how data quality is curated for the whole exome Spark data? Does sequencing and processing the data at different locations at different times create concerns about variations in data quality? Yeah. Well, there's a big um, commitment to, to data cleaning um, there tends to be, you know, families are sequenced together. Um, there is, uh, we have a large uh, informatics group, including a bioinformatics and data analytics group, and we have clinical scientists on the Spark and Searchlight team who are also sort of helping, and we have a, a what we call a return of results team with, uh, with four geneticists who are looking at it. So I, I'm not going to say that it doesn't create concern, but I'm going to say that it's a concern that we address. Um, through the way that we set up our processes and the people we hire to work on the data. And we confirm a lot of the findings. We confirm, you know, we do clinical confirmation of all the findings, so, yeah. Hi, Dr. Martin, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so coming in today, I was kind of wondering what efforts were being done to address the disproportionate amounts of ASD in different racial and ethnic backgrounds. So I'm glad to see those concerns are being addressed by the Simons Foundation. Um, so what, can you share some of those efforts and give us some practical things as practitioners and researchers that you know we can take us today? So we, um, about a year and a half ago, I think we had a request for application for new clinical sites to really focus on recruitment of African-American black uh, participants. Um, they came in with different approaches. A lot of them were very community-based, going to different settings, whether some of those were faith-based settings, some of them were more sort of other community organizations um, to uh, talk about autism, talk about SPARC, 
um, and really have had some, and, and going to parts of the country that have really different demographic representation um, in their population. There, um, I view it, and, and also bringing in a great um, equity, diversity, and inclusion community, uh, commit advisory committee to help kind of guide us what should we be doing. Uh, bringing on a um, marketing firm to help us think about how do we tell the story about Spark. There are lots of concerns about the history of, um, of genetics, um, about the history of clinical studies in different populations. So how do we just head on address those concerns? Um, and I would say, you know, we've made, um, when I say we've made advances, what we've done is we've recruited more black participants. I think it's going to take some more time until we change um, the percentage of black participants who consent to have their, um, to give saliva and get sequencing. And frankly, I think that's fine. I feel like it has to be a, a kind of a journey of trust where they get to know who we are. But we have to start somewhere. So that's where we're at right now. I would also just add that we do support a large project in South Africa and, and Kenya to get at yet another population and really working to change um, sort of the, again, even the diagnostic criteria. Um, but so looking also outside of the United States. That's not SPARC, the SPARC is the United States. So I hope that answers your question. Great, looks like we've reached the top of the hour. Please join me and give one more round of applause for Dr. Martin. It's a great honor to have you join us. Thank you so much for a great talk. I have lots more questions that I wish we had more time to answer. So uh, if I'm correct, I believe we do not have Discovery Series in October, so please join us in November. Thank you.